Govind Das, good to be with you. <laughs> so great to Thank be you here, for coming Steve. over. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Great to share this moment. Uh -huh. How are you? All is good. You know, I, uh, it's a busy time, as you understand, with two little kids and, uh, and the family life, wife, yoga studio, and all of the good things that come with that. So everything is is busy but in in the best of ways you know my i feel very grateful my my life is filled up with so much love and and uh and i'm headed to india in three weeks oh, so wow. that's always knowing that that's just a short distance away i always seem to feel this kind of excitement in my heart and uh i'm really looking to to head back to India, so it should be wonderful. That's your annual. Indian yeah, every, trip, every year I take a, a group uh, over Thanksgiving time. Do you have any spaces left? We do we have a few spaces All left? Right, listeners, yeah. check it out. Yeah, I've got a few spaces left. Anybody want to? Where join they can? In? Where can they see that? Um, if they go to our Bhakti Yoga Shala website. Okay. Yeah, that's right. where it all is. Oh, India, it, it mm. is deep in my heart. One mm. of my favorite places to go back to. Yes. Haven't been for quite a few years yeah. since uh, Soleil was two so three years ago okay and that pushed us that we we had a big retreat we were hosting 37 people or something like that and Soleil was only two and mm. she got really sick oh, and she yeah. had a big fall actually she Ouch. uh knocked herself out oh. she got concussion like temporary concussion and we we're deep in uh like just north of rishikesh and it was crazy some yeah. festival was on and we we're trying to get to the hospital and it was <laughs> it was oh, gnarly yeah. so that shook the family a bit of course we haven't brought our time. kids yet and it's mm. because of exactly right. what you just said it's just a, still a little bit of concern maybe they're too young and it's a lot yeah, it was but we great. really want to uh -huh. we really want to yeah. at the right time at the right time we, how old are the kids 3 and 8 yeah, maybe so, like when they're five and eleven. Yeah, I don't know like if they they're going to wait that long. They want to go. Oh, they want to wow. go this year too. I mean, it was amazing when we took Soleil. She was two. As soon as she got there, when she was seeing all Hanuman and Ganesha, she was calling them out. Yeah, and we were blown away. Everyone was blown away. I bet. And. She was just really connected and then loved the Ganges and mm. everyone just loved her. For the most part, it was all positive. Yes. Apart from that gnarly fall oh. and getting really ill. Mm. But it was good for the most part. For, for those most. challenges, I mean, yeah, they're yeah. all revealed in India. Yes, the blessings and the challenges. Yes, huh? <laughs> yeah. So how do you find Govindas, the balance of managing and owning a yoga studio and a family life, two kids, a wife? In all honesty, how are you yeah. finding the, the balance? Well, you know, for me, it, it, it all is, has this root in this, just in this intention of service. You know, that's really where I try to show up from, that place of serving. And, you know, this is the... The message that's been given to us and, you know, from the great ones, sadhus, saints, masters, teachers, yogis, you know, when, when you show up in service, things actually, even the most complicated things actually become pretty simple. So that's where I try to live my life from. Am I always successful? <laughs> no, absolutely not. But um, that is an anchor that I intentionally moment to moment are, are anchoring into, you know, just from that real um, pure, humble place of, 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 of selfless service. And uh, so that's how I manage it. You know, that's how that, that's the only tool that I know of to manage it in a, Gosh, in an equanimous way. Otherwise, it just is. It's so much, especially in the world and the times that we're living in right now. Do you have practices in your family life that help you if it's one of those bad days and you're mm -hmm. you're just not balanced? You're not being of highest service. Do mm -hmm. you uh, do you have a practice to? call yourself out on that and recenter and or is that just part of your devotion right now yeah well that, that i think you know that 
it's a part of my life. It's just, it is a walking, breathing, living part of my life. Yet, you know, the practice is every day. And my main practice is just keeping these divine names in my mind, on my lips, in my heart. And, uh, and that practice, you know, for me as my guru, Neem Kroli Baba, has given us just repeating this name, Ram, this very simple name of God, Ram, Ram, Ram. And what that reminds me is to, is to show up in integrity, to show up with a pure heart, to show up living and acting dharmically. And, uh, that is very central and that helps me, that simple practice, it just helps me to come back to gratitude. Mm-hmm. And I know we have this, everything is gratitude now, gratitude. It's, it could be just lip smack, gratitude, oh, grat. But it's very real. Mm-hmm. When we show up with a grateful heart, every situation of life can transform itself. And uh, so that's where I try to live, is, is from that love, gratitude, service, devotion, and constant remembrance, you know, that, that spirit is always here with mm-hmm. us. Beautiful. Yeah. Back to Neem Kurali Baba. Can you please share where that connection began for you? Yeah, for me, it, it began through Ram Das. Mm-hmm. You know, when I was oh, about 25 years old or so, and now I'm 47, uh, I was in Florida with my parents and a friend gave me an audio cassette and said, and I was about to drive to New York City from Florida. And, and she said, you know what? Listen to this. Put this in. You're, you're a cassette player. <laughs> That's what was going on back then. And I did. Right as I left my parents' house and I listened to it, the 24-hour drive, I couldn't stop listening to it. Which one is that? It was... I can't even tell yeah. you which, which one it was. It was mm-hmm. so long ago, and there's yeah. been so many that I've listened right. to since then. But it, I heard a human being saying everything that I had felt subconsciously within my soul. And that's when I first learned of bhakti yoga. And I had already been practicing yoga and teaching yoga at the time. And literally this audio tape, lit, learned, listening to Ram Das and um, l- you know, being introduced to Maharaji Neem Kroli Baba at that point, it truly changed the trajectory of my life. Just this one lecture, audio tape. And uh, it gave me so much more of an insight into how vast this yogic tradition is so much more than just, of course, asana that we know of and what this path of the heart is all about, this path of devotion, this path of devotional service, this path of love. And I heard this, you know, what this, what this bhakti is all about. And it just, in that moment, it resonated right away that this is what I want to devote my life to. It was that clear. Um, Maybe because, you know, my, even from childhood, I always felt that love is, love is it. That's really the most important thing. Mm -hmm. And then to hear that there's actually a path of yoga that's just dedicated to this. Um, that was all I needed to hear. So it's been this, uh, you know, 20 plus year journey now, just following this path. Mm. And when you got transformed into Govindas, when, when, when was that? Well, that was a few years later. One of my uh, teachers or elders in the Neem Kroli Baba tradition, his name's Raghu Marcus. He's a very well-known um, just being teacher, great man, Kirtanwala, all of it. He runs a lot of Ram Das's organizations. We were at a Kirtan and he called me Govindas. And I kind of took a you know, wasn't really sure what to make of it. And he's like, yeah, that, 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 that's your name. That's your name. And, um, funny thing is now when we talk about it, he doesn't even remember saying it. (gasps) Yeah. So, uh, I just sat with it for years, maybe four or five years. And, um, 
Then in the early 2000s, I was at a kirtan workshop with Jayu Tal, and we were doing a circle at the beginning, and everybody was uh, saying their names. And for whatever reason, in that moment, I never really felt previously uh, called to use the name. And in that moment, when it was my turn to introduce myself, I said, you know, my name's Ira Rosen, but I was given this name many years ago. And now it feels like the time to start using this name. And that's, and that's the way it's been since then. So I came back from the, the training and I started to uh, just change the name on my schedule, on the yoga schedules and so on and so forth. And uh, it's been just a really beautiful process. And, you know, as it helps me to remember what my dharma is, which is, is to serve you know, to be a beneficial energy to others, to help in this great transformation that's happening on this planet right now, to do my part, however small that is, and to uplift the, the vibration of of the the planet and help us to remember who we really are and what's really important. So Beautiful. Yeah. Um Often people share when they've got, been given a spiritual name that they get a lot of flack in the community. Ram Dass was very <laughs> candid about when he first re-entered America with Ram Dass and he was getting called rammed ass yes. and Ram Dass, like computer yes. terminology. And yes. There was a lot of shit mm-hmm. dished on him. Did you experience that from family, old friends and stuff yeah. like that? I did. I mean, it, you know, I did, but it was never enough to really sway me because I just felt so connected to it. And, uh, you know, so yeah, it, 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 it was all pretty natural. Yeah. I think just because my focus was so one pointed and, and this is, this is what I want to do. You know, this is how I want to show up. And I was teaching yoga and living, you know, amidst community sangha. So, you know, in that community, most people are pretty open yeah. to that Beautiful. Yeah, for sure. Now the chanting thing, your ability to merge that into hatha yoga, the physicality, yeah. that's a really beautiful combination. That's mm. what I do myself mm. as well. Often there still is a divide between people yearning for the, the bhakti, the bhav, the, the devotional qualities, and the physical. How do you find navigating that? I mean, you, you've taught thousands of classes now. Are you able to witness that, that divide and kind of merge it together? How, how do you experience that? Merging yeah, the physical I do. The you know, sometimes you just literally, you just see this look on these people, on people's faces that is just like resisting mm-hmm. the whole thing. And so we just kind of sweet talk them into it. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but you know, here's, I think the, the thing though, is when there's that critical mass, there's enough people in the room as you know, our studio has been open nine years now and you know, so many regular people and there's a whole big group of people that are into it and want it and know what's going on and sing from their hearts loudly that it makes it a lot easier now for the newer people just to slide into it. Oh, this sounds pretty cool. Oh, this, you know, this big group of people chanting these money. And there's no, it's not deniable when you hear a, a, a group of people singing together, there's something very potent about that. That's now when I first started showing up with a harmonium, uh, I remember vividly at Brian Kess studio, power yoga above uh, radio shack on fifth street in the late 2000s, I mean, I'm sorry, in the late 1990s, I remember people would walk out of my class. Right. Yeah, they'd just walk out. This isn't <laughs> yoga. So, uh, you know, as I'm sure way. you know, you, you see it all, right? You sign up as a yoga teacher and you see all of it. And mm-hmm. it's such a great reflection for us just to keep us ourselves straight and clear and compassionate and kind and and of course strong and courageous as well too to keep stepping out there and sharing what feels right for us what our authentic truth is 
And it's confronting using your voice in that way. And mm. many of us have shut down that faculty. I, uh. I remember in the early days of my yoga practice, I was obsessed with the physicality, repulsed by anything devotional. Mm. And I would have been one of those people mm. that would have walked out. I wouldn't have owned. I wouldn't have put my hands in prayer. I yeah. wouldn't have done any of that. I didn't even take Shavasana at that yeah. time. Like I've done my yoga, time to get out. I was that yeah. hooked on doing and that distracted mm. and actually that like at the time, like allergic to anything devotional. Yes. Like I, yes. I, I think I can even recall a feeling of like purging. Like, oh, like, <laughs> well, because you know, <laughs> a lot of it has such an association with our, you know, early spiritual traditions in childhood and, and all of the stuff that our churches and temples and synagogues and rabbis and priests have thrown onto us that is, uh, you know, a lot of it is, sounds just very dogmatic mm -hmm. and not so agreeable in this beautiful universal kind of mindset that I think we're all evolving into that we're tasting through yoga as well. Yeah. Yeah, so it's understandable. Um, but at the same time, if we can move through that stuff, what it offers to us is something so delicious, you know, that is that the asana itself can't quite get to, mm -hmm. I don't think. You know, the singing, it just, it really... The kirtana, it, it really works through the heart, like the inner heart, the spiritual heart. It, it, it clears the heart. It cleanses the heart. It purifies the heart. It, it lifts up the heart. It strengthens and affirms our connection to, to that unconditional love that is who we are. Like Krishna Das says, it, it's like a key that, that, that unlocks the door of the heart that we've locked ourselves out of for God knows how many years, decades, even lifetimes, we can re-enter into our own hearts, which is our truest home. And it's so powerful. You'll be doing it in a class, repeating a mantra, and then it, it's continuing on. It gets mm -hmm. subtler and subtler from heart to full consciousness to back into the body. It really can feel, especially when you're applying it with asana, can be a deeply embodied experience, not just a temporary, a temporary bliss moment in the heart, but then potentially a powerful tool to then bring into your life, like you talked about earlier. There, there's a continuum of the vibration, it seems. Mm, absolutely, it is a gift. It's a, uh, you know, we have. Uh, my feeling is the two main tools that we have to to really to influence directly influence our state of mind at any given point. A state of mind, state of heart, is breath. Of course, we know that as we start to adjust our breathing, it, it, it directly influences our state of mind. This is what Buddha taught. Mm -hmm. And mantra, that's the second one. You know, mantra is ancient yogic sound vibrational technology that that is a tool, mantra, a tool for the manas, the mind and the heart, to transform the qualities of the mind and the heart. That's uh, That's what it is for. And this is the, out of the, the, the love and mercy and compassion of the great ones that have walked the path before it, they have passed it down to us. And, and in this time that we're living in may be more relevant and important than ever that we have these tools. Here we are. How are you seeing our unfoldment in the near future? I was just speaking to Mark Whitwell and he's like, this five years we're in right now are absolutely crucial. You know, if we don't get it in the next five years, we're, it's going to be very interesting times. You know, how, how do you yeah. see our very near future, not to mention the, the distant future? You know, I, I don't know. I kind of mm -hmm. think the world is the world and the world will continue to be the world. And all we can do is work on ourselves. You know that, I mean, this is the teaching. One of the main teachings that Ram Das has given us is that all we can ever really do is work on ourselves. And when we work on ourselves and, um, that's the, the primary aspect of our spiritual work, 
we can then relate to whatever is going on outside of ourselves uh, just from a more harmonious place. And, you know, the world will still be the world. Yeah. And it's all of its fucking craziness, you know? It's just, it's mad. And I think it always has been mad. Mm -hmm. And it always probably will be mad. And, and we are living in this time right now where everything really does seem amplified, though. That's for sure. Yet, I don't know about you, but having kids, like, my, I'm just focused on the family. Like, I don't even focus too much on the external mm -hmm. types of things. It's just like this laser beam focus on keeping the balance in the in the in the family amongst the the screaming and yelling kids and crying and boo boos and <laughs> that's, that's all I can focus on. <laughs> and the world will be the world. I'm just going to keep showing, getting up, waking up early in the morning, doing my seva, doing my practice, offering my prayers, doing my devotion, repeating my mantras, doing my asanas, being with the family, going to teach my classes, sing my kirtans, and. You know, God will take care of the rest of, of those details. And um, yet in saying that, it is, you know, it is an interesting time. There is no doubt about that. And, uh, you know, I think so much of it really is just because of technology. That's mm -hmm. my feeling. is because everything is so accessible right now. And it really, truly is right at your fingertips. And, and there's a lot of positive things that come from that. You know, there's a lot of dharma that's being spread through the internet. Truly, there really is. And and on the other side of the coin, there's a lot of really awful things as well, too, that are coming with it. And um, and I guess you know, I'm always reminded of that great teaching. Life is that 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 dance between light and shadow, and it it will. And in the world, that's where that shows up as that dance. There will always be really crooked people and <clears throat> there will always be really amazing people. And, uh, yeah, so that's, that's my feeling. But I, you know, I just have faith. I've, I've always just been somebody, n don't know if it's a good thing or not, not a good thing, but I've always just had faith in people and faith in, in things and, and always seen the, the cup half full instead of half empty and, and just trust that everything is unfolding as it, as it should. It's all in divine hands. It's all in mother's, uh, you know, perfect hands and she's supporting it all. And, um, yet, you know, at the same time, I realize we all have our karmas as well too, that influences things. So, <sighs> I don't know. <laughs> Big X. <exile. laughs> Big X. <exile. laughs> <laughs> Yeah, Neem Kareli Baba, back to the great Baba. Um, one of his main teachings was that suffering is grace. Yes. And I remember Ram Dass sharing of quite some time ago, this would have been late 60s or early 70s, there was a, a catastrophe that had happened in Bangladesh and he was all passionate to get his minivan and rescue a whole lot of people. And at that time, Neem Kareli Baba was saying to Ram Dass, it's all it's all perfect. And at that time where Ram Dass was seeing it from, he thought uh, Maharaji was talking absolute shit. He thought it was, uh, how could this great saint, this wise, compassionate man say it's all perfect, yet all these people are dying and it's just a complete shit show and he's wanting to go save them. And there, there's Neem Kurli Baba just sitting there. It's all perfect. Ram, Ram, Ram. It's all perfect. And that's exactly what you're speaking of, that deep faith, that deep shraddha that yeah, it's mad, it's crazy, but it's actually perfect as yeah. well. That, that great paradox of it's all unfolding in, in perfect timing. And I think we can often glorify the good old days yeah. and when it was all so simple and mm. perfect and beautiful, but it, it never was. Right. Any recorded history was never perfect. Right. If, if anything, it was even more mad in other ways, yeah. in, in more kind of primal ways and whatnot. But even you look all the way down into insects and, and yeah. the, uh, every sentient being has an aspect of just mad shit that goes yeah. down, huh? Yeah. yeah, absolutely. You know that story that you just told about the, I think it was an earthquake in Bangladesh mm -hmm. or something like this. It, I heard that story that Ram Dass told many years ago and it really influenced mm -hmm. me. 
You know, it really influenced me. And, and I think so much of the stuff, it's a balancing act. Like, like it's all perfect, but we have to, at the same time, do our best to promote positive change, right? Because that could be a cop-out. It's yeah. using that spiritual cop- truth that right. it's all perfect can just kind of do nothing. Right. Yeah. So, uh, you know, the, the, that, that fine line, that balancing act between, you know, everything is perfect the way it is, allow things to be the, as they are, but at the same time, keep working to make the world a better place at the same time. So... Yeah, doing that with the kids is a fine balance as mm. well. Like having those boundaries, like oh. holding that space of love and just letting them explore at the yes. same time, uh, laying down those boundaries. That, that's that been a yoga practice in itself <sighs> for me. That's having that, that is me too. Man. Yeah. I mean, honestly, the, the practice, the yoga practice of parenting, it has taught me as much or more than anything else in my whole life and it still is every day because uh you know that those boundaries that they need it the kids need it and my tendency is just not to have those boundaries just to you know let everything flow and and uh but you know i realize that if i don't create those boundaries and those lines that I'm doing a disservice to them. So I have to create those boundaries and, uh, it's not easy, you know, because of this, I think fear that my kids won't love me anymore. Mm. If I create those boundaries or I say no, um, but that's, that's what has to be done. And, and, you know, for me, it's a growing process, getting more and more comfortable in that. And, uh, yeah, what a what a practice of being being a data as, yeah. as you. Yeah, I'm sure you understand too. It's it's just amazing, mm-hmm. teaching us so much, and uh, the love that comes with it is like you know, just like crazy. How the 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 way it fills up the heart, and um, but it's not easy. That's for sure. Constant practice. It is constant because they're so fluid, and you never know how they're going to show up, and. And, uh, and, and they, you know, with two kids, they both have their own desires and their desires are completely different at any given moment. And they really want these desires to be fulfilled. And if they're not fulfilled, chaos ensues, you know, they, they, the, the big breakdown. And so, uh, you know, we do what we can and, but you know, without it, without these practices of, of yoga, without these practices of meditation, without these practices of, of bhakti, of, of devotion. Oh my gosh, how could I ever do this? Yeah. It would be impossible. Well, it'd just be the old, the old way. Well, there it is. That old way, the old story, the, the, um, you know, the violent, um, you know, response to situations and, and so on and so forth, which then these next generations carry on without and they give to their kids. So hopefully we're, we're breaking that chain a bit, you know, and, and again, helping to create a new paradigm for humanity Mm -hmm. through them. Yeah. That's why I have loved bringing Soleil and Nalani off to other cultures Mm. rather than I mean, I would also love to get off to India and Bali and these beautiful places I love to get to by myself, but we're doing it as a family unit. Yeah. And I'm looking at the blessing of immersing the kids into those cultures because that has been one thing that lit me up from the get-go of getting to these quote-unquote third world countries and seeing how little they have and but how happy they are yes. for the most part. Of yes. course, the the extreme poverty, no, Um that we need to work on ways to bring remedies to that. But seeing these families all in, you know, a room the size of this, 10 people and they're so happy and so peaceful. And it, it was probably my own projected view as well. I'm sure they would have their own desires and whatnot and their own madness behind it. But there did seem like a tranquility and a beauty and a love energy that isn't so common in our, in our Westernized culture. And I think because on some level, and it's not certainly not everywhere, but the family unit is still intact. 
You know, yeah. they're all living together, and there's something very deep and powerful and rich about that. And I think the simplicity of life. You know, obviously the cities in India are just like the cities here, but you get out and into the country, into the villages, and, and there's a simplicity. And in that simplicity, there's there's peace. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think a great, uh, you know, message that we can all take from that is even in our cities and living in our busy world, if we bring mindfulness and that simplicity um, into even just the simple moments of our life. And that's a practice because the mind wants to complicate things so much that maybe we can live a little bit more peaceful within our, you know, the dynamic that we have set up here. And technology with the kids. Can you speak to that a little? Huh. I mean, with Soleil growing up with an iPad, I mean, we, yeah. we call upon it when we're flying a lot, you know, that 24 hour yes, trip from Australia, we use it a lot, but it's a blessing and a curse instantly, yeah. like constantly, like, like crack. It just fulfills, but then it's a disaster when you take it away. How have you found the realm of technology and as the kids grow and that whole thing? Well, it, exactly what you said. The biggest fights that we have in our family are taking the iPad away from the kids. It's hysteria. It's totally crazy, it's crazy. to the point where... Literally a few weeks ago, I had to wrestle my eight-year-old boy <laughs> down to the ground, wrestle him to get that thing out of Fuck. his hands. There was no other way. <laughs> oh, but I had to stay true to that boundary that it was enough. He, he, he just wasn't it, letting up. And he wasn't letting up. Shit. You know, it wasn't a violent no. wrestling, but it was a wrestling to show him that I'm going to take this away from you and you need to let go of this. Um, so, yes, it's... it's uh, you know, it's, 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 it's the way it's going. There's I mean, it's no in schools. It's, it's everywhere. It's so everywhere. To deny it fully and just wouldn't right. work either, would it? You know, well, I mean, you know, it's, it's interesting because we were just, um, sharing some, uh, yoga and bhakti and kirtan with a Waldorf school mm -hmm. a few weeks ago, uh, fifth graders at Waldorf and Waldorf really focuses a lot on no technology or very limited amounts of technology. And, Honestly, these kids were incredible. Right. They were incredible. They were their eyes were so bright and open, and they were answering questions. And there was just this beautiful fluidity in their energy, and they were singing kirtan with us, and and it was so, all so natural. And uh, so I don't know, man. It's it's a real tough one. It truly is. Every single day we take it away. My three year old daughter um, ends up crying her eyes out every single day after her 30 minutes or whatever our time limit is that day she's crying which to me seems like well maybe she's not ready for it yet that her brain is just doesn't have the ability emotionally she's just not ready for it yet so then i think to myself well maybe i'm doing a real disservice to her even just letting her have these 30 minutes mm -hmm. of it you know so it's very confusing. Yeah. The whole thing is, is actually extremely confusing. And, you know, I don't know, and I, I just certainly don't have the answers, but at this point, you know, we, we do give our, both of our kids, you know, a bit of, of that every day. And, um, yeah, man, it's it's a it's a real tough one. Yeah, we're playing with different balancing acts with that as well. Yeah. Currently, we're limiting it to just the weekends yeah. and a little time during the weekends that's been good yeah i've heard like, people uh, doing that and saying that that's real that good. that's worked well yeah and just during the week especially getting to thursday friday soleil starts to ask for yeah. you know movie night and ipad and stuff like that again yeah. and we start to just while she's still centered and not like already in the trance of the ipad yeah. start to just have like intelligent conversation around it yeah and, and just talk about the negative aspects and just sure. in a way that she can hear. And it's been good. It's been good. Yeah. And there's still a, like the come down and right. the, the crack attachment and uh, still not good, but yeah. better. Oh, good. Yeah. Good. Yeah. My, my son, you know, and I've seen with both of them, it, it can really help develop their brains and understanding. There's lots of great apps for that. Mm -hmm. 
Um, but as they get older, they they really want to get more into violent games. You know, right. at eight years old, a lot of my son's friends are getting into the Fortnites and all of the other kind of stuff now. And there's a lot of violence. And we're, we're, that's one thing we're very, very strong about that. The no killing, no no violent within the, the media, violence within the media. Um, but a lot of his friends are getting into it. And that's the difficulty of what my friends are, my friends are. But... You know, we just say, uh uh, that's not happening in this household. So there's a lot of, uh, the negative of it is that they can learn violent behaviors and, and be turned on to that almost excitement of, mm-hmm. of, of violence in, in, in these games. And so mm-hmm. we're really not into that. But, um, sports, you know, apps that have that kind of stuff, simple games, you know, that's, that's kind of where we're going with mm-hmm. it now. And like then the, uh, the, um, virtual reality yeah. that's coming through, it's just yeah. going to get more and more real the yeah. sensory feedback. The- and, and I feel it myself. Like mm-hmm. I can't really work on my phone for more than 20 minutes and my eyes start to get really yeah. sore and I start to get a little headache. So if that's happening to me, then you think about, you know, these younger ones that are so sensitive. Yeah. How it must affect them too. Yeah, apparently there's some pretty strong links to to the the blue light coming through yeah. all these screens and ADHD and yeah. ADD, which seems like common sense. I think yes, it'll it become does. common sense in the future. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The EMFs and mm-hmm. everything about it. I, uh, it's you know I kind of resist it all. Like it's certainly not my choice to be on social media or the phone or anything. Um, if I had that choice, but now it's, it's just the way of the world, the yoga world, as much as anything, it's all through, you know, it's all through, through technology and computers and emails and social media and, and that sort of thing. So, yeah. <sighs> Govind Das, I would love to hear your views on psychedelics and yeah. their place in in sadhana. Of course, our beloved Ram Das had a, a huge uh, chapter in his life of being a pioneer with psychedelics. Yeah. And it seems to be emerging really strong in, in the yoga scene and the spiritual circles around the world. What's your view on, on psychedelics and their place in sadhana and yoga? Yeah, you well, think? you know, I can really only speak for myself, and it's been a very big part of my journey. Uh, in f- going back to, f- you know, first, um, when I first started using cannabis, marijuana, back when I was 17, uh, no, not 17, 20 years old, eight, 19, 20 years old. I didn't start, I started much later than most people in college. But even I remember, I, I I felt some kind of deeper connection. And then after that, mushrooms, and I felt a much bigger connection. I felt it was my first taste of of oneness, of interconnectedness. Um. So for me, it it really opened me up to my spiritual self and spirituality as a whole. And I never really even knew anything spirituality versus religion, you know. So this opened me up to spirituality, that we all have our intimate, our own intimate and personal connection with spirit. And so then through college, you know, mushrooms mostly, a, a a little bit of LSD as well too. And then after college, absolutely, as I started getting into yoga and meditation, I continued. You know, this was in the 90s and early 2000s and that sort of thing. So a little bit different than it is now. But uh, it was a very important part of my unfolding. And then, um, you know, I had one in, uh, what was it, maybe 2007, I, I did ayahuasca for the first time and a para- very powerful journey with that. And, uh, and then mm, my wife Radha got pregnant and, uh, I stopped using pretty much everything, even stopped using ganja for a year or so just because it was all so new and so fresh and I just felt like I needed to be so clear with every micro moment of the way. 
And, uh, and then I started using cannabis and ganja again about a year after he was born and, but ha- didn't use any, anything else until I was just in Peru this summer. And in the last year or so, I've just started to feel this, this attraction towards or desire to, towards using whether it was ayahuasca or, um, or, uh, mushrooms or, and what came to be while I, while I, while I was in Peru is, is that what kept revealing itself, we were in the sacred Valley and everywhere we went, um, the shamans were saying, no, don't use ayahuasca. Don't use ayahuasca here. And I had this feeling that Peru was going to be everywhere, but they were like, no, ayahuasca is jungle medicine. This is the sacred valley. This is the land of Huachuma, um, which is here. It's called San Pedro. And uh, in America, it's called San Pedro. It was used by the Native Americans as well, too, of cactus. And uh, so we did a ceremony, not all of us, but uh, about half of the group, we did a ceremony at, at Machu Picchu. And it was fabulous. It was, it was you know, it was not like ayahuasca to the extent where it it was like a deep surgery you know an inner surgery it was it was joyful it was playful this medicine man he had us dancing and singing the whole time and we were just connecting with pachamama with mother with mother earth and uh, and it was fabulous it was absolutely fabulous and i there was a real um letting go that took place, you know, that I think this is what the psychedelics and plant medicines, they help us do. They help us to let go and come back to who we really are. We can get so lost in who we think we are and come back to really who we are in heart and soul and spirit and that just that vast presence that we are. And, uh, so it's kind of like Ram Dass said after he had his big, sort of thing with it you know he would say I think he said something like every year I'll do it once or twice just to check in and see where I am and that's what I'm kind of feeling now you know a lot of people are using it as a path you know and that's not really for me right now where I am with the just the roles and responsibilities that I have I don't think that would be the 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 best for me but to check in for me personally it feels like a good thing and you know i i still i i i have a long time love with cannabis and and use cannabis almost every day of my life and uh it's been so amazing to watch its unfoldment you know now in california it's legal crazy and now what's happening in canada all over canada it's legal and now the stock markets are you know are it's big business now so it's it's really an exciting time for that but it's always been you know cannabis is lord shiva's medicine and it's so deeply intertwined and connected to the yogic tradition and and the psychedelics can blast us open you know it's strong and for me the cannabis has always been a just that kind of gentle third eye reminder and i you know i've always used it as sacrament you know and it's not a party thing for me it's a meditation thing and that's the way um in the shiva bhakti tradition that's that's the way it's supposed to be used as as sacrament as that you know to connect with our own heart and to connect with the heart of the universe at the same time so um but I do, I, I believe wholeheartedly in, in psychedelics and plant medicines that uh, they can be great tools to open doorways for us into our um, deeper being and, uh, and reflect things that we need to see as we've all experienced on journey, psychedelic journeys that it's not always easy. You know, a lot of fear can come up, a lot of worry, but we got to move through that stuff. We got to be willing to look at that stuff straight in the eye. So that's, uh, that's kind of my feeling. How about yourself? Joe and I have a deep connection with lots of different psychedelics, mainly ayahuasca. We, we pretty much met through, through yoga primarily, but really met like heart to heart, Mm. soul to soul, a deep mystical experience through ayahuasca Mm -hmm. end of 2012 and uh, we 
had been both uh, really committed to the medicine for that that two year period before the end of two thousand and twelve and had a deep relationship with it and decided to have a ceremony together and that 's when we s- literally saw Soleil, mm. our daughter mm. uh, her soul asking to come through us wow. we weren 't together, Joe and I yeah. That brought us together. Wow. And we, we, we're still speaking about it regularly, yeah. unpacking the profundity of that experience. And undoubtedly, if it wasn't for the medicine, we probably wouldn't be together. Yeah. Or it would have taken a long time of building a history yeah. and, and rationalizing having a baby, which in some contexts is a healthy thing to do. Yes. It's not always a healthy thing just to leap into that. But we did. It was so undeniable. Yeah. The bliss mm. was, uh, it was, it was the biggest peak experience we had both had. So for one, we've got a deep relationship with ayahuasca on that level. We, similar to what you said, we check in every now and then probably yeah. once or twice a year with that. And for, for me, for us, it feels like a retreat. It's like a lot of it is work, like a lot of unpacking and cleansing and clearing, and then just a deep magnified awareness of who we truly are. Yeah. So it feels like an awesome opportunity to tune up and upgrade and yeah. cleanse and expand. Yet, uh, same thing, like uh, taking a uh, being responsible for kids and being a responsible householder and a business owner and all of that, I feel it's not the time to do it regularly for yeah. me. There was a time yes. and that was a great time. Yes. It was a great time of going so deep mm. in my sadhana. Like it felt like a, a deep part of my yoga practice. It is. Yeah. It is. But Absolutely. if it wasn't for the yoga practice, I don't know if it would have been a healthy thing right. for me. Yes. Like, and I've, I've been seeing that a little bit in the medicine community. Yeah. And they're getting honest about it as well. We're Good. talking about it, about uh, without there being a, like an embodiment practice, right. it seems like it's often not a healthy thing. Like, yeah. like if the medicine is just the primary practice, I don't know if there's many people that can handle that mm. without there being a breath practice, an embodiment practice, a contemplative practice yeah. to then integrate it unless you're going all the way yeah. and you're, you're being in the jungle and you're, you're that, that it's, is truly your path. Mm. But if you're trying to be in the world as well yeah. and take care of business and remember your postcode and bring up a family and all mm-hmm. that kind of thing, it seems tricky. Yeah. It and, seems tricky. And do you know, the foundation of, of having Dharma in our life, mm-hmm. it protects us, you know? That old saying, if you protect the Dharma, it will protect you. So we devote ourselves to these teachings and there is some kind of great protective energy that can allow us to do things like that and hold it all together. Yeah. But I, I feel exactly like you. If it, Without the psychedelics, I wouldn't be who I am and I w- certainly wouldn't be doing the things that I'm doing in my life right now and the, the service that I'm doing and the the, you know... None of it, I really believe, would be, um, would be what what is right now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, San Pedro has been a strong ally for me. I felt as I've grown into my manhood, my my man roles, my father role, that has been like a really strong ally for oh, me. Okay. I felt a very strong feminine energy, of course, from. Mm mother ayahuasca and more of a masculine energy from the masculine from the from the cactus so definitely since becoming a father i've felt more drawn to uh sitting with san pedro more than ayahuasca every now and then there's a big calling to just go so deep into the heart so deep into the unpredictable realms with ayahuasca yes but with the uh the masculine not that it's more predictable but for me, it's more grounding, mm. more functional in yes, a way. Like yes. it strengthens me and clarifies the mind and uh, feels more earth orientated. Yeah. So I felt that's been a great ally for me as well. Yeah, I yeah. look forward to using it again. And mm-hmm. I look forward to the grandmother as well. I really do. Mm-hmm. I, I I feel ready and I feel like we just, 
you know, uh, with a couple with two kids and, you know, it's just, I would, with me and Radha, we would like to do it together and, and the right time for that. But with the kids and everything that all of the busyness, it's, mm-hmm. it's been difficult to f- find the right time where we can have that 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 chunk of space that we can really mm. dive into it and unwind and have a little space to process it as well mm. too it's quite interesting because here ayahuasca is legal yeah as yeah. is cannabis yeah in australia it's highly illegal so ayahuasca is highly and um so are people using it people then? are using it a lot yeah yet there's a cloud of paranoia oh, around it okay and secrecy and um I feel a real difference between the communities here and in Hawaii where it's much more open. The conversation is yeah. much more public yeah. and honest, yet there's a lot of secrecy and yeah. um, a lot of people doing it, but um, a lot of secrecy and paranoia yeah. and, um, and and some shit has actually gone down, which has amplified that mm. um, and I think is serving its course and just people being a little smarter in who they uh it's not for everyone yeah. it's such powerful medicine it is so powerful. it's so powerful it is so powerful so oh. it it's not for everyone no. and it seems through the trials and tribulations of it there's just a bit of discernment around it because yeah. apparently even uh with the with the shamans and whatnot it wasn't even the the, the quote-unquote the people that would drink it it would just be the shaman right and then they'd connect deeply like kind of like guru energy and right. go into your heart and your soul and do the healing in that yeah, way yeah so i think it's pretty new yeah for uh, the circle the people yeah to be drinking and, and and you know that's what the message we were getting in peru as we were asking about it is that no it's not for everybody it's for just the 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 mystics the the ones that are really committed to the this this process of going deep within themselves um because boy it can bring up all of the demons and yeah so it's a it's a big one yeah yeah but it's amazing how you know what i keep thinking how look at all the people now that are are this that are just the spiritual tribe global culture of of people waking up it's young it's 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 really happening right now you know when i started meditating in like 1993 or something like this i I was afraid to tell my friends that i meditated and now everywhere right now it's maybe we're a little jaded here because it's so uh west los angeles it really is everywhere Mm -hmm. and maybe it's not everywhere outside of here but You know, just the language. I mean, even Instagram. Look at look at the the spiritual language that people have really woken up to, and I, I really believe so much of that is the the first, very first person to plant these seeds for Westerners doing this is is Ram Dass. Mm. You know, he was the first one that gave us this this um, this new language to explore and understand the soul. Yeah, and he's Huge. continuing to do it. Continuing eighty seven. 88 now. 88? Yeah. He's still doing it. He's incredible. Yeah. I remember um, Raghu Marcus, no, Mirabai Bush, talking about uh, Ramdas being re That's what they're finding. That's what everyone's finding is he's being re even though he's aging and hmm. body possibly isn't doing so well, but he is. Like, he's yeah. vital. He's the most glowing person yeah. I know. Yeah. And the funniest. And the this youthful energy that has been kind of rebirthed in him since the stroke. Yeah. And um, it's wonderful to see. And he's still pouring this wisdom. He just released a book and yeah. still doing his huge retreats and still just pouring it out. Like, the dharma of that man has just yeah. been exquisite to I, be a part of. I just listened to the Oprah, the latest Oprah Winfrey Super Soul podcast mm-hmm. with Ram Dass. Oh, really? Oh, my gosh. He was just so right on. <laughs> like, only Ram Dass can possibly share these great truths and insights like he shared. Mm-hmm. So he's still doing it. Yeah, we we love our time with him in, on, on Maui. We go for swims with him and do kirtans with him at his house. Yeah. And seeing him in the water, mm. just like a baby, just just 
chanting and oh boy, oh boy, oh joy, oh joy. It just, yeah, it's a deep, great. deep love for Ramdas. Yeah. Us. yeah. Is there anything you'd like to share with the listeners? Your upcoming retreat, any oh. other upcoming events or anything like that, Govindas? Gosh, lots of good stuff happening. Because we're you getting know. to the, got to pick up the want, kids from I school. I don't want it to end. <laughs> this is too nice. It's yeah, so it's been lovely. Our uh, sangha. Yeah. Uh, short sangha in the middle of, a, what is today, Monday? Monday, Monday morning. Monday, it's done yeah. the week. Yeah. yeah. Anything else you'd like to you share know, with everyone? All good. All good. Yeah. Lots of good stuff happening, you know. Um, what do we got? Our the India retreat coming up in November, and then uh, we do a teacher training that I lead and yoga teacher training in uh, January, and you know, just next year with lots of good stuff. April or what? March a Bali retreat in April. Another Kirtan training. It's a fifty-hour, you know, training of learning to. Um, sing kirtan and play the harmonium and uh, we're actually in the fourth of fifth weeks that we just finished yesterday so next weekend is our last weekend we do it in the spring and the fall and what a, it's it's I just can't believe that I fall more and more and more in love with this practice of kirtan it's like there's no ceiling to it it's just ah the process and practice of singing together as a group and singing to the Lord, it's it's like, you know, and every culture has somehow used singing and dancing as a as a tool to to come together with each other and, and come together with, with God. And uh so I just what can I say? I love Kirtan. All good. Yeah, it's a true gift. I yeah. love I love being a part of your kirtans. I love hearing it. Yeah. I wish I could get down more. Mm. Right now, our nights are very early with I'm little sure. Lani, but I'm I sure. hopefully can get down for one or two yeah. before our well, tonight. We got Monday night kirtan. Oh yeah. What Always time is it kids. again? Six thirty. We open the doors. And uh, usually about seven we yeah. start. It's always on Instagram Live now too uh, at Bhakti Yoga Shala's All Instagram. Right. So. I do that, and uh, but there's always kids, so oh, yeah. always kids yeah. at Monday night. You know, little kids, big kids, running around. I love that. Yeah, I love that. Um, I love Christian dust deeply, mm. as you do as well. Yes, but he doesn't like kids being at the kirtan. Oh, really? I <laughs> yeah, didn't know that. he did a kirtan in Perth. Um, not long ago, just a couple months ago, yeah. and and we didn't go because he didn't want kids. So yeah. uh, whenever I hear that kids are welcomed and loved, it any kind of event like that, I, I deeply appreciate it. Otherwise, yeah. we just tend to not go because Joe and I are tag teaming. Get your and, kiddos. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I I always love the kids because I think about how I wasn't in environments like that. How can you see 100 people together actually getting along? Not only getting along, but singing and laughing and dancing and celebrating life together. I never, I didn't have that image. Did I. When did I have that image? Maybe at a sporting event or something, you know, a pro football game where thousands of people. But that, you know, a completely different vibration. Mm -hmm. So to see you, uh, a large group of people together, adults together, that the kids are looking up at, to me that that's a uh, what a imprint in their psyche totally, totally. So i, yeah, I yeah. love it and i tell the parents don't worry if your kids start screaming and yelling and laughing and just let them run you know we're that's gonna, great we're gonna sing louder than them anyway yeah <laughs> that's so cool like speaking of that imprint um yeah i think that was part of my resistance to anything devotional i grew up with my mother trying to bring in the jewish tradition yeah. or jewish but all i was seeing was these angry old men yeah and these controlled women and just uh, a, a sadness, a bitterness, an anger, which later on I could understand. Yeah. But at the time as a kid, I was just thinking, get me out of this shit. Yeah, me and too. As soon as I grew I could, up Jewish too. Right. And I felt the same exact thing. I always pushed it away. Mm -hmm. I just didn't want anything to do with it. And the only thing that I that really turned me on was, was hearing the cantor sing these great, these great songs. And that was the seed of my love for, for devotional music. Mm. 
But really, but what's been interesting, I don't know about you, but coming to this bhakti, I've actually fallen in love with the Judaism too. Yeah. Not, not, so that, I, not that I practice it, but mm-hmm. when, you know, I, I love it as a part of my backdrop and mm-hmm. culture and, um, and, and now I actually choose to go to the, the high holiday services and, and, uh, I really love it. Full so circle. It's, that's, a, that's what's so amazing. I think, uh, about these these dharmic traditions is that it's it it's points you know it it allows us to embrace and and love actually mm. the root tradition that we come from yeah couldn't agree more yeah love your work govinda it's oh, great to spend you, time with so you so great to be here and, yeah until and, next uh, time look forward to it yeah bye Ram, everyone Ram, Ram. Ram.